Hello and welcome. I'm Anna Danziger Halprin, Associate Director of the Center for Women's History here at New York Historical Society. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to thank Louise Muir, our President and CEO, Agnes Xu Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max and the late Adam Max and the Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members and our many other generous donors. None of the work of New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. As the Associate Director of our new Center for Women's History, I'm proud of the growth we've achieved here at the Center since opening only a few short years ago. Our scholarship, education programs, public programs, collecting initiatives, and not least of all, exhibitions, all foreground women's critical role in American history. Tonight's program, Civil War Secrets and Spies, will run up for approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. At any time during our program tonight, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature located on your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we can. And now I'm delighted to, to introduce our panel for the evening. Douglas Waller is a veteran correspondent, author, and lecturer. In almost two decades as a Washington journalist, he has covered the Pentagon, Congress, the State Department, the White House, and the CIA. From 1994 to 2007, Waller served in Time Magazine's Washington Bureau. His 10th book is called Lincoln Spies. Born in North Fork, Virginia, Waller holds degrees from Wake Forest University and the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and is a former captain in the U.S. Army Reserve. Elizabeth Barron is Langbourne M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia, and is a member of the Executive Council of UVA's John L. Mao III Center for Civil War History. She received her PhD from Yale and has held teaching positions at Wellesley College and Temple University. A specialist in the Civil War era and 19th century South, her book, Southern Lady Yankee Spy, won three book awards and was named one of the five best books on the Civil War away from the battlefield list in the Wall Street Journal. Her most recent book, Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War, won the 2020 Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize and was named one of the Wall Street Journal's best books of 2019. She's currently working on a biography of James Longstreet, forthcoming with Simon & Schuster this year. And my colleague, Dr. Allison Robinson, is the Milan Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow in Women's History and Public History at the New York Historical Society. In this role, she co-curated Title IX, Activism on and Off the Field, as well as two exhibitions that are currently on view, Crafting Freedom, The Life and Legacy of Free Black Potter Thomas Kamara, and Kara Walker, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated. She's also contributed research and text to the landmark exhib exhibition, Black Dolls, and is editor-in-chief of our blog, Women at the Center. Prior to joining New York Historical, Robinson worked at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, James Madison's Montpelier, Virginia Humanities, the Historic New Orleans Collection, and the Colored Conventions Project, an award-winning scholarly and community research project. Robinson received her PhD from history, in history from the University of Chicago and an MA from the Winter Heather Program in American Material Culture. We're so thrilled tonight to have Allison, Doug, and Liz with us today. I'll now turn the conversation over to Allison to get things started. Thank you so much for such a wonderful welcome, Anna, and thank you to Liz and Doug for joining us today for this really rich conversation all about espionage during the Civil War. So on that note, can you set the scene for us and give us an idea of the importance of espionage to the war effort during the American Civil War? Sure, and welcome to everyone out there. Uh, uh, so delighted uh, for you to join us on this uh, lovely evening here and looking forward to a great conversation. So espionage is vitally important for, uh, for both armies. Um, both take a while to get their acts together uh, and, and consolidate proper espionage uh, operations that have any degree of sort of uh, centralization. So there's a lot of kind of ad hoc and improvisatory espionage of a kind that will will describe, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't note that 
one of the most fascinating elements of Civil War espionage, um, and, and I think ultimately the most important, is the work that African Americans did on behalf of the Union Army. Uh, and some of them are um, spies whose names come down to us and whose stories we can reconstruct and trace, but there are many, many, many more where we just have fragmentary evidence uh, because they made their way to union lines, they told the uh, union authorities in the places in the South that they ran from to get to the Union Army, that they had knowledge of the terrain, of the geography, of the, of the um, culture and politics and personnel and so on uh, of the region and offered their services. And oftentimes they appear in the historical record only fleetingly, a, a, a sort of typical designation in, for example, the Northern press for all of these uh, countless, I mean, literally countless African-American spies for the Union uh, was a label intelligent contrabands, uh, 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 which was um, contraband was a, a term that refused to refer to fugitive slaves who had uh, run from Southern farms and plantations to find refuge with the Union Army and to offer their services to the Union war effort. And intelligent contrabands, this was meant to uh, a label that the press devised to refer to those bringing intelligence uh, uh, of Confederate troop movements and, and, um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the disposition of Confederate armies. So um, it, it's, this is just a long-winded way of saying that we have, there's some famous individuals we'll talk about and highlight today, but there's also this world of espionage that um, is very much a sort of collective enterprise and that, and that we've only just begun to, uh, to recover. It's one of the things that makes this field exciting is there's, there's always uh, you know, new discoveries out there. Another thing uh, I don't know that struck me about you know my research into this, and I'm not uh, a Civil War historian. Don't even play one on TV. I I uh, covered the CIA uh, for uh, Newsweek and Time magazine, so I approached this whole project of looking at Civil War espionage as uh, to how it uh, you know relates to what you know uh, the modern agencies do today. What I'm struck with is that you had really, during the Civil War, a revolution in the way uh, armies spied on one another. Uh, you, this was the first railroad war uh, where troops could move from one position to another fairly quickly. It was uh, The telegraph became very, very important in terms of communicating commands uh, from Washington or headquarters down to the field, field units. As a result, uh, signal intelligence, today they call it SIGINT uh, in CIA jargon, became very important. Uh, uh, cryptography, uh, coding messages became an important uh, uh, undertaking during the Civil War. Photography, I mean, we all, you know, like to, you know, look at the Matthew Brady photographs of, uh, you know, Civil War soldiers standing stiffly, but uh, some of Brady's photographers, for example, worked for the Union Army taking photos of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of Confederate uh, installations and, and the battle areas where they're going to fight. Uh, aerial reconnaissance was really pioneered during this war. Uh, the hot air balloons that uh, they were able to uh, put in, or the hydrogen filled balloons that were able to put into the skies. Uh, this was the first time, you know, that this was used in, uh, in any appreciable sense. I, I'll never forget being in the National Archives at one point, going th flipping through microfilms of uh, Civil War documents, and I finally stopped on one where a, a Philadelphia inventor proposed to General McClellan's uh, staff that uh, they hoist up a balloon uh, carrying a camera and that the, uh, there would be a wire from the camera down to a, a soldier on the ground who would uh, you know, click it or something to, uh, uh, to take a shot of uh, what was uh, a photo of what, what was out there. And I kind of paused for a second. I thought, my gosh, this is an aerial drone. <laughs> like the, ones the Russians just knocked down <laughs> the other day. Uh, now, it turned out, uh, uh, the project officers, the union projects officers looking at this uh, rejected the idea because they couldn't figure out how you could get the balloon steady enough to take that photo up, up from the sky, which was the truth. Uh, 
but it was one one example of where uh, new technologies was coming into this war uh, uh, this warfare uh, in, in the intelligence collection area that was uh, you know, having a profound effect. And of course, there was the, there was the traditional Matahari's type spying, you know, sending human spies uh, in, into uh, each side's territory. Incidentally, it was made a lot easier during the Civil War because the spies everybody spoke the same language. It wasn't like World War II where you were dropping, you know, uh, commandos into into countries where they didn't speak the language or uh, or spoke it poorly. So it wasn't too easy, for example, for a Union spy coming down south to fake a Southern accent uh, and blend in. Uh, so you you had kind of the traditional uh, espionage work here, but as I say, you had uh, a lot of new high tech. Uh, or then considered high-tech endeavors. I think you two have really eloquently captured how collaborative effort, technology, and access really help make these espionage efforts successful for both the federal government and the Confederacy. I think to really help us uh, grasp how this is working on the ground, this is a great opportunity to delve into a specific example. So you both have written two really beautiful books, highly recommend that everyone read them, about Elizabeth Van Lu. Can you tell us a little bit about why she's so important and a little bit about her life leading up to the Civil War? Absolutely. And one might begin by quoting a very memorable line from the uh, uh, Union's uh, intelligence head in the uh, region in the Eastern Theater where where Van Lu worked, he would say after the war for a long time, Elizabeth Van Lu represented all that was left of the power of the federal government in the city of Richmond. Now, you know, you think about that for a moment. This is the 19th century. Van Lu can't vote. She can't hold office. She represented all that was left of the power of the federal government. So who was Van Lu? About what kind of person could you, could you say this remarkable sentence? Van Lu was a white Southern woman from a upper middle class family, lived in a, in a Tony neighborhood of Richmond, had come from the North, but assimilated fully into Southern society uh, uh, before the war, uh, who developed qualms about slavery, opposed secession for some complicated reasons. She believed that Virginia's role um, in American politics should be as a mediator, uh, not as, a, not as a, a, you know, the leader of this rebel insurgency. Uh, and she decided when the Civil War broke out in Richmond, her hometown, the capital of the Confederacy, to um, remain true to the Union. So she represents what we call an unconditional unionism. There were uh, white Southerners who had a conditional unionism. They were unionists until the firing of, on Fort Sumter, until Lincoln's call for troops, until war was a fait accompli. Among white Southerners, there were relatively few unconditional unionists who were determined to support the Union no matter what. So she made such a pledge to, to support the union no matter what, and uh, established uh, sort of um, without any external direction or prodding initially, a spy ring, an interracial spy ring of black and white unionists in Richmond who were determined to help the federal army. And their efforts begin in a, in a, a sort of a primitive way. Her first goal is to help union officers who are imprisoned in Libby prison in Richmond, a prison uh, a, a POW um, uh, sort of uh, site uh, there in which union officers were held by the Confederates. Uh, so she got messages back and forth to them. She'll eventually help to engineer a big breakout from, uh, from Libby prison. She and her unionist circle helped um, other unionists in the city flee the city to make it to northern lines. Eventually, they'll be enlisted directly into the federal service. I'll pitch things over to, to, to Doug for this, and we'll and we'll, we'll you know come back to the details of all of this fascinating story. You know, uh, Elizabeth Van Lu uh, was one brave woman. She was. I mean, I, I've always said it's easy to be a liberal in Vermont or a conservative in Alabama, but switch it around and it becomes a little different. She uh, was not shy about voicing her pro-unionist views uh, about uh, her abhorrence of slavery, which uh, was nurtured uh, with uh, visits to Philadelphia to relatives there. Uh, and uh, she became really, even uh, as the war 
uh, began a, a pariah in her own city. I mean, she started helping out uh, union prisoners, uh, uh, trying to bring them uh, food or, you know, reading material or medicine, uh, which uh, earned her, you know, rebukes from uh, her neighbors, uh, from Richmond uh, newspapers that were rabidly, uh, you know, secessionist and pro-South. Pro uh, she started uh, this spy ring really from scratch. I mean, she didn't go to Langley uh, to the camp, Camp Perry to learn how to become a spy and everything. In fact, all the spies really, you know, uh, began, you know, really on their own and ad-libbing ad it. Um, in that day, uh, women, uh, if they wanted to participate in the war, had two choices. They could be a nurse or they could be a spy. And many of them did become spies and very, very successful spies. But they learned on the job. And that's what Van Lu did. Uh, and she ended up being a very uh, proficient and successful spy master within Richmond. Uh, which which was remarkable because she had no training in it, but she adopted a lot of tradecraft techniques that you today CIA still uses. Uh, in fact, you can go to the CIA to some of their analytical documents where they analyze how uh, Van Lu was pioneering some of these uh, uh, these type of es espionage methods. Uh, it's a, a really remarkable lady. That's a, I, I love that uh, observation, Doug. I didn't know that about the CIA, you know, uh, citing her work. That's that's very exciting for me to, to, to learn that. Oh, yeah. I mean, they uh, they do a lot of lessons learned at the agency. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Van Lu was uh, has was someone uh, they've analyzed in the past uh, because she she practiced very sound tradecraft. She hid her uh, material that she collected. Uh, she really uh, operated in plain sight. Everybody knew she was a unionist, uh, but fortunately for her, Southern chivalry, today we call it Southern chauvinism, but then it was Southern chivalry, chivalry uh, couldn't conceive of a woman, you know, being able to know anything about military matters uh, and being able to collect intelligence on it, too. Uh, and, and, you know, she got investigated and probed and, uh, you know, surveilled uh, by uh, Southern uh, security officers, and she eluded them all. She uh, defeated them all. Honestly, this is such a perfect entry point into delving into what that tradecraft really was, because in espionage, access and concealing your intent is everything. Can you tell us a little bit about what Van Lu and her spy ring was doing to fulfill these goals? Yeah, absolutely. So some of it, um, just as Doug has said, it, it's it's very sound, although technologically pretty pretty basic. She had a cipher uh, in which she could write in code. Her operatives used invisible ink. Uh, they hid messages which her network uh, was able to take to Grant and hollowed out eggshells in the soles of their shoes you know, uh, uh, fairly primitive in that sense, but uh, uh, incredibly sophisticated at the same time. Eventually the union gets word of the fact that there's this unionist a woman, the union authorities get word of her uh, existence there in Richmond and Benjamin Butler and other federal army leaders reach out to her and formally enlist her into the union army's service. And her role after a phase in which she'd been focused on prisoners, her role in the last year of the war in which Grant is laying siege to Richmond and Petersburg and trying to move his chess pieces as Lee moves his chess pieces on that board as it were, her role is to get information to Grant. And, and through a system of couriers, she's again, the spy master in her family's mansion at Churchill in Richmond. She's a middle-aged woman. She's not, uh, 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 you know, uh, hoofing at herself excuse me here, my light automatically goes out if I don't move. Um, her uh, her um, operatives, uh, 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 black and white, would, would take messages to City Point, um, uh, some 30 miles uh, away from Richmond, um, to the federal, the headquarters of the federal army as it, as it laid siege uh, to Richmond uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and Petersburg. And um, she was able to establish quite regular contact with U.S. Grant. And again, access, there's on the question of access, I'll take say two things before again, uh, sort of uh, handing the baton over to Doug. There was, there were some remarkable 
instances of access. So Van Loo, the Van Loo family had a, an enslaved woman who lived uh, with it, worked for it, uh, um, named Mary Jane Richards. She went by many different uh, it, other aliases, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, to avoid detection over the course of her fascinating life. But Mary Jane Richards had been given a sort of secret freedom by Van Loo and her mother. She'd been sent to Liberia, a place where uh, uh, freed uh, uh, slaves, former slaves were colonized by a movement called the African Colonization Movement. Before the war, she requested to return to Virginia. Freed slaves weren't allowed to return to Virginia. Uh, she had to pretend to be the Van Loo slave to live in their midst during the war. Um, she had a kind of secret freedom. And somehow, you know, through the machinations of Van Loo and Richards herself, Richards gained a job as a domestic servant in the Confederate White House, Jeff Davis's White House, and got access to papers on his desk and so on, a kind of a, one of these many Civil War stories, you couldn't make it up if you tried, it just it was better than any Hollywood script that you could write. But but that that degree of access was unusual and also fleeting. The more typical kind of access was, to get back to Doug's point about technology in this war, railroads. So the Confederate Army is moving troops back and forth between the Richmond Petersburg front and and uh, a front in the in the Shenandoah Valley and and Van Lewis guys standing at the train station, you know, seeing if the Confederate troops getting on trains going west or Confederate troops coming in on trains from the west, and she's able to, to report on troop movements to Grant uh, through that kind of posting of operatives in opportune places. She. Uh... She also was very security conscious too, uh, which uh, you didn't find among a lot of the spies uh, during the Civil War. You know, I, I mentioned that they all kind of had to learn as they go. Uh, some of them remained uh, amateur spies throughout the uh, war and really uh, you know, had, had no contribution uh, to the Civil War effort. There were some uh, women uh, spies like Rose Greenhow uh, who were more show horses rather than work horses, as I would say. They, uh, you know, they talked a good game uh, about it, but their actual impact on, uh, on battle, the battlefield was really negligible. Van Lu uh, knew how to keep secrets uh, she, uh, for example, in her mansion, at, at her fire fireplace's mantel, she had uh, two statues, two couchant lions, where she uh, hid in uh, small documents uh, in there to, in case she got raided. She had some at her uh, bedside table that she could get uh, quickly uh, disposed of if somebody came in. And she got raided several times, but uh, she didn't fall for uh you know uh, security officers that tried to trap her uh at, at different points uh she you know there's a there's a kind of there's a saying in washington among intelligence community circles that uh the, those who uh those who don't know uh talk and those who uh don't talk uh know and uh Van Lu is really a, a, of that second category. She kept very, very quiet about uh, her espionage. She practiced good operational security, uh, which she carried over even after the war, too. Uh, she stayed quiet about what, what she'd done in that war yeah. uh, uh, for, for really for the, for the rest of her life, because uh, there was a danger, because she was a very effective uh, agent. And we might add on this question of access too that you know the most important access was to Richmond itself. So this is the Confederate capital, and what Van Lu was able to tell Grant in that last crucial last year of the war, which he's losing a lot of men in his campaigns in Virginia. He's coming under some fire, as is the Lincoln and the Republican administration. She's able to report on conditions within Richmond and say, Grant, you know, hang in there. Your strategy of attrition is working. The Richmond population is, is becoming demoralized. Inflation is running rampant. They're herding old men and boys into the army. They're, they have, they're in constant panics about the potential, uh, you know, arrival, breakthrough of the Union Army and the need to evacuate and so on. So she was able to, to report on, on, on morale in Richmond, declining morale in Richmond in ways that boosted 
the morale of Grant and his army and, and some of the Grant's close aides de camp and so on have, you know, left us records of eagerly sort of awaiting messages from Van Loo's uh, spy ring, uh, you know, around the campfires at night at City Point, uh, looking forward to, to, you know, the word they would receive from, from Van Loo and her, and her operatives. She uh, delivered uh, three, uh, an average toward the end, an average of three reports a week uh, to Grant. Uh, she also sent him a daily newspaper, the daily Richmond newspapers accompanied with a, uh, a rose that she uh, added to it, which uh, Grant thought was uh, kind of neat for his uh, breakfast table. Um, she was, uh, and in, the, in those reports, there was, as I say, was a lot of detail, particularly about the movement of Confederate forces uh, from Richmond up to the Shenandoah Valley or, or back. Uh, which Grant used at different points to uh, uh, to attack uh, the, the the other side. So uh, at this point, it it it, it did make uh, she did make a difference uh, in, uh, in in those in that final period. Uh, whereas, say a lot of the other spies, uh, you know, you know added, you know, or, or uh, contributed intelligence, but it was nothing that was as, as decisive as, as what Van Loo did. Um, you know, th there's another thing you have to kind of keep in mind, too, is there, there was no one operation or no one spy gamut that won the war or that really turned a tide of battle anywhere. This was a war that basically was won because uh, the North was able to produce far more uh, you know, or out manufacture the South, uh, uh, field more troops uh, into the field, put more armaments uh, into the battle, and basically wear the South out. Uh, intelligence played a role at different pivot points uh, in the war, but uh, this was a bottom line, uh, you know, a, a war of attrition. That said, though, uh, in the final battles in Richmond, Grant had a very, very clear picture of, uh, you know, what what he faced in Lee's army. In fact, toward the end, Grant had a better count of the number of men in Lee's forces than Lee did. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, he he knew more about Lee's army than uh, Lee did at that point because, you know, he was leading, you know, in some respects, a scattered mob. And, and this just briefly, uh, uh, you know, gets us back to the, sh the the quote about all that was left of the power of the federal government in the city of Richmond is that um, I, I would sort of add to Doug's assessment of why the union wins the war that the union's superior leadership, that of Lincoln, that of Grant, and, and some other critical figures made a difference. And I think Van Loo should be classed among those people exercising leadership that that proved uh, uh, decisive. She, she uh, as we're saying, part of the message here is that this is someone who showed enormous uh, initiative and did and emerged as an important uh, leader and 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 um, you know at the same time one who was being very very careful about the ways that she projected her power because she was she was trying to um, avoid avoid detection. Yeah, uh, Van Loo's actually her final her final final handler uh, in the Union Army was a an officer by the name of Colonel uh, George Sharp. He's uh, the source of the quote quote that I, uh, I mentioned. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's, uh, he was a New Yorker, a uh, very educated man, uh, spoke several languages, uh, kept a book of verses uh, in his breast pocket that he would pull out every now and then and read to his men, uh, which they didn't particularly mind hearing. Uh, he was a pioneer in, uh, in intelligence gathering at the time. He began what's uh, become known as all source intelligence, where you you collect intelligence not only from your operatives in the field like Van Lu, but from what the signal uh, intercepts told you, uh, from what your cavalry scouts uh, brought back. And you put all that together uh, to give the commander a concise, realistic, and I emphasize realistic view of the enemy on the other side. Now, this kind of all sounds obvious to us today, but back then it wasn't. Uh, he was uh, doing some very, very innovative work uh, with, uh, you know, with intelligence gathering and this all source intelligence. This is incredibly fascinating and it leads really um, beautifully into a question from one of our audience members. Uh, how did these spies get their messages to Grant? We know that 
Van Lu did not work alone. She was part of a much larger network. Can you lay out how this network operated and how a message got from point A to point B? It, it was uh, uh, operatives who were, um, uh, uh, you know, assuming the guises of civilians in normal roles, taking, uh, uh, you know, agricultural produce to market, for example, but messages are, are hidden again in, in, uh, in the, 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 you know, the, 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 the cart that their uh, uh, horses are, 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 you know, are, are moving, um, for example. And I think that the, really the key point there is that Van Lu's network was uh, an interracial network that included uh, both black and white unionists. Um, but the African Americans in the network were, uh, in a sense, the, the true heroes because the risks they were running were so high. The risk of, of being caught, the risk of exposure, no mercy was shown by the Confederate Army to African Americans who were caught spying or suspected of spying. And so, you know, the theme of courage has been a bit of a, of a keynote of everything we're saying about, about Van Lu as an individual, but Mary Jane Richards and, and those, again, largely nameless, you know, uh, operatives, we can we know the names of some of the, the, um, the, the men and women who were her sort of principal uh, agents, but, but we, we don't know the names of all of them. And, and uh, enormous risks were, um, were incurred uh, by the people who were just pretending to go about their business, you know, taking goods to market, for example, but who were, um, in fact, uh, she had a, a series of way stations. And so a, a message would be taken to one place and the baton, in effect, passed to another person who was, you know, seemingly just going about the business of everyday life. Yeah, there, there were several different techniques she used uh, in communications. The first one was just invisible ink. They had invisible ink back then. Uh, and she would, initially she'd write letters to a general, uh, in, in a union general uh, in territory that the uh, union occupied in Virginia. Uh, and the letter would, uh, the, the regular writing on it would be some uh, you know, just routine family news uh, exchanged back and forth. And you could still exchange letters back and forth between the North and South then. But between the lines, she would use her invisible link and she'd been taught how to use this by the union officers who came to visit her. Uh, she'd type her real message, which the officer on the other side then would uh, uh, wave that uh, letter over a candle to warm it up. And that would show uh, the invisible ink, the true message. That was one way. Then we mentioned the little cipher coach. It was a, uh, it was like a oh, three or four inch by three or four inch square sheet of paper that you can convert letters into numbers. A very very crude cipher code. I mean, it would take uh, you know a crypto analyst today you know less than a minute to uh, to decode. But back then, uh, it was it was fairly effective. She would take for longer reports very often would have her couriers, uh, a lot of them African Americans, take different portions of the uh, of the report. She'd uh, literally tear them off in strips and give some of the strips to one uh, courier and other, other strips to another courier. And they'd all go uh, down uh, to the uh, Union uh, forces at City Point uh, where they would piece back uh, together the strips and, and get the full message. The African Americans uh, spies in her network uh, were particularly effective because nobody on the southern side thought that uh, there were any African Americans that were smart enough to know anything about the military or you know or, or smart enough to spy. So even though African Americans uh, you know were heavily restricted. You know, they had to carry paper. You know, they just couldn't roam around uh, the city or anywhere. Uh, they were allowed to pass through a lot of the southern checkpoints that the whites wouldn't, or get near encampments that the that the whites couldn't uh, get to, uh, because nobody, uh, everybody figured they were harmless, uh, and they, you know, they weren't. They didn't need to bother with them. Uh, but what uh, the union officers did, and these these are the officers and that handled union intelligence in Washington, and even in the field, realized that, you know, the, uh, the African-American uh, spies, you know, had good memories, could, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, absorb information and, uh, you know, present a lot of detail uh, to the union side. The, so, the, yeah, go ahead. No, please go right ahead. No, I no, can... no, I, I don't want to preempt a question, especially if it's from the audience. Uh, I was going to build off of this conversation since you both have mentioned how integral African-Americans were to this network of spies. I was wondering if you could either tell us more about their roles or delve more into kind of the myth of Mary Elizabeth Bowser and who she actually was as a person. Yeah, absolutely. So this this was a, a fascinating uh element, maybe the most fascinating of my own Van Lu research many years ago now, and other people have come along and added to our to our uh, our picture of, of Van Lu and, and of Richards. This uh, work we do as historians is very cumulative and, and collective. We're always building our base of knowledge. But at the time when I wrote my biography of Van Lu, we knew a, a good bit about Van Lu's um, work and there was the the reason uh, Allison is so uh, you know correctly referred to a kind of myth of, of Mary Elizabeth Bowser is uh, there was a sort of story that had been circulated about uh, a Van Lu slave having worked in the Confederate White House and passed information uh, to Van Lu and that name that came down through history to us was Mary Elizabeth Bowser as the as the name of that person and um, there were uh, many accounts without the sort of things that historians like the scholarly apparatus, the citations, the paper trail that enable you to trace that story back to its roots in the period itself, to documents where you can see how, 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 how you know, where did this, where did this uh, story come from? How can we verify it? So I was doing some research on all this and I, I discovered in the archives and newspapers, uh, especially that the story of Mary Elizabeth Bowser that had come down to us of a, of a enslaved uh, young woman who worked in the Van Loo household who was given a secret freedom and sent to Liberia, who was who asked to be returned from Liberia, who then worked in the Confederate White House and after the Civil War, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, disappeared from sight. That that story mapped onto the story of a woman who I did could find Civil War records of and about, and that woman's name was Mary Jane Richards. A Mary Jane Richards worked in the Van Loo household, was uh, sent to Liberia, requested to come back from Liberia, um, and worked. I found once I had that name as a as a as a, a clue, you know, to to look elsewhere. It came to light that a Mary Jane Richards had. Uh, taught for the Freedmen's Bureau after the war. In other words, she reappears in the historical record after the war. This, again, great heroine who took enormous risks. I, I wasn't able in my research, so I, I concluded that Mary Jane Richards was Bowser, and Bowser was, was, a, it was a, 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 you know, one of the aliases uh, she used as she was trying to avoid uh, detection. Um, I wasn't able to find a source from the war itself that put her in the Confederate White House. That frustrated me, but, but um, since I was able to corroborate almost every other element of the story, I felt good. Then some years after I wrote the book, and this invariably happens, we finish with these projects, but they don't finish with us, especially when it's someone as interesting as Van Lu. Um, a, a researcher who was doing some work for one of the, the um, uh, wonderful libraries in, in Virginia um, said that they found an article from 1865, I think it was September or October, uh, in an uh, African-American paper in New York called the Anglo-African, published in New York City, one of the major black newspapers in, uh, in the North, saying that a Mary Jane Richards had given a speech in a black church in Brooklyn that fall, in which she said, I was in the Confederate White House and, uh, you know, doing this espionage. And again, that story, just the other thing she said, just confirmed that Bowser was Richards and Richards was a real person. And, and there's a, there is a, uh, a, a way to document her story. I was delighted because it was confirmation that that the connection between Richards and Bowser, um, you know, was was the right one to make. I was chagrined that I hadn't found that newspaper article, but but it, it just you know goes to show how we're surprised all the time in the work we do. I I didn't imagine in a million years that Richards would show up in Brooklyn, New York, in the fall after the war ended. I had no way of knowing knowing that or anticipating that. So. Um, 
So yes, she was a real woman. Uh, we're still piecing her story together. A, a scholar named uh, Lois Levine is, is, I think, working on a, a biography um, that will, um, you know, uh, uh, f follow up on leads that have come to light since I wrote my own book. Um, but but the, the thing, I'll just conclude this, this uh, portion of our conversation by saying the following. The, the key to understanding any of this is that is to strike a balance. These women, Van Lu and Richards, were exceptional, right? They were utterly exceptional. There was only one Elizabeth Van Lu who led this spy ring and was this incredible spy master. There was only one Richards who got work in the Confederate White House and risked all to pass that information on to Van Lu. They were also representative, and what they were representative of was Southern Unionism, the, the support of Southerners for the Union. The most important Southern Unionists were African Americans who, who, who uh, you know, not only helped the Union Army through espionage, but 150,000 African American men who were Southerners would fight in the Union Army, wearing the Union blue. Van Lu represents white Southern Unionism, a much smaller, uh, you know, group of people, uh, but, but nonetheless, important, important symbolically, important militarily, uh, 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 for reasons that Doug, uh, Doug has explained. And, and the sort of broad takeaway from the story of, of Richards and Van Lewis, people who are representative, not just exceptional, is that the Civil War was a war of South versus South. Uh, there were, it, you know, we, we in, our, in our shorthand, we tend to equate the South with the Confederacy, the North won, the South lost. Well, if you were an African-American in Richmond, when that Union Army shows up April 2nd, April 3rd, it's an army of liberation. You, you feel you won the war, not not lost it. So uh, they're a reminder, you know, that uh, as, as we all use that shorthand, but we should be careful because there were um, uh, uh, Southerners who, who wanted the Union to win, who prayed and worked and hoped for liberation, uh, uh, for the Union Army to liberate them. And, and you know, Van Lu, in her diary, she writes about as the Union Army enters Richmond, you know, oh, army of my country, how glorious was your welcome. She, you know, for her, that's an army of liberation. Yeah, I, uh, my research into uh, Mary Richards, and really uh, it was based on the ground rate breaking research that uh, you did, Liz, uh, on her initially, which uh, you were the first one to kind of introduce a note of skepticism about you know, the stories that have been passed down from uh, from journalist to journalist to historian to historian uh, that uh, ended up wildly inflating uh, her, uh, this one particular infiltration. What I was able to determine really from, uh, from, the, uh, from the New York uh, newspaper articles and what she actually admitted to in public was that one time uh, she went to the uh, Confederate White House, uh, supposedly to pick up some laundry, uh, but thought she'd go in and see if she could snoop around. And, and they let her in. And she ended up wandering into Jefferson Davis's office uh, when he wasn't there. And started. she kind of started rooting around a little bit. Davis walked in on her uh, and basically shoot her off. I mean, Dave, Davis could not conceive that a, you know, as I say, an African-American, you know, could, uh, would be a spy uh, coming into his, uh, into his office. So he just, he just shoot her away. That was her really her only time uh, in, uh, in, in the Confederate White House that I could uh, piece together. What happened over the years was a story developed that uh, Elizabeth Van Lu had infiltrated her into the White House, and she stayed there for a long time as a member of uh, the, the household staff there, and uh, and listened to you know cabinet meetings and had access to everything, and, and brought back an, uh, an in, a trove of intelligence, and you can still see that in some of the uh, writings today. It's a great story, just doesn't happen to be true from what I can, I can tell. What I was able to discover was that, or piece together was that uh, the story kind of got uh, sparked by uh, Van Lu's nine-year-old niece, who 50 years later told a magazine correspondent the turn of the century that he recalled something about, uh, Mary Richards being infiltrated into the uh, 
uh, Confederate White House. Now, people at the time that were, you know, saw this report were wondering how a nine-year-old girl uh, would be given, uh, you know, access to this type of sen sensitive uh, intelligence information and how she would remember it in such detail 50 years later. Turns out it was a Harper's uh, Magazine reporter that kind of dialed up the piece. From that point on, the Mary Lou Richards story became too good to check out. Uh, there and it became inflated that this was, uh, you know, this big infiltration operation. Even though uh, uh, Verena Davis, uh, Jeff Davis's wife, said he she never, you know, hired anybody from uh, Van Lu, uh, and it's hard to imagine that she would have hired somebody full time from Elizabeth Van Lu, who was a well known uh, unionist uh, living in Richmond. Uh, and so, you know, even even though it was it was you know just getting into the Confederate White House and getting into Jeff Davis's office was quite an achievement. Uh, you know, this story grew kind of all out of proportion, which you which you get a lot in 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 intelligence histories and intelligence uh, writing or writings about intelligence. You know, stories get uh, blown up even to this day. Well, and there's also something, you know, in a sense, uh, political going on here in, in, in I, I think, first of all, that Richards, we have every reason to believe that she helped the spy ring in other ways, you know, oh, that, yeah. that, that it wasn't wasn't the, the infiltration. I think that's part of the message. The infiltration is is, is a but part of relatively fleeting uh, a part of what she, uh, you know, what she does. But um, the, all of the African-Americans in Van Lu's inner circle in her household were 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 sort of uh, uh you know, trusted uh, with with um, uh, you know maintaining and extending and 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 um, uh, this network and 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 you know acting as operatives, taking risks, even some risks, of course, that Ben Lu herself didn't take as the as the uh, as the spy master. But but it was important symbolically. So for Richards to go and make that speech in which she said, um, "I was a spy for the Union during the Civil War." Uh, is 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 staking a claim that goes beyond what we can verify about this or that thing that she may have done. And what she's doing is staking a claim to patriotism, to being a unionist, having her unionism recognized. So for African-American men in blue uniforms, well, that unionism is visible and it's acknowledged and the contributions to the union war effort are acknowledged. But African-American women not wearing blue uniforms made countless contributions to the union victory. Some cases are famous. Harriet Tubman was a scout and spy in, in the uh, you know, coastal uh, uh, Carolinas helped the Union with some some um, operations to free slaves uh, uh, in the Deep South. Um, Su Susie King Taylor, a camp follower who became a teacher um, of a, of, a, of a freed people, uh, left a memoir of her life as a camp follower. There's some uh, uh, Harriet Jacobs, who um, the famous fugitive slave, wrote a searing memoir of a life in slavery, and then uh, um, started a. a, a and worked for a relief for black refugees in Washington, D.C., Elizabeth Keckley, um, uh, a, a very famous seamstress who worked in the Lincoln White House and also contributed to these refugee relief efforts. There were many, many ways in which Mary Richards is representative, but many ways in which African-American women aided the Union war effort, but they tended not to get the credit for it. That 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 soldiers did, again, because they weren't wearing uniforms. And so and so that that um, that uh, staking that claim to having been a wartime unionist and having t taken on those risks was a was an important move by by Richards in that post-war speech. Yeah, Mary Richards, she was a skilled operative too. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, I mean, she had been beaten in prison uh, when she was incarcerated briefly. Uh, and she was very expert in, in handling herself around uh, white Confederate soldiers. Uh, around around the enemy, and so she vacuumed a lot of information uh, just walking about and everything. In fact, uh, Van Lu, there's kind of uh, uh, I, I've I, I read uh, you know would ask her every morning you know what had she seen what had, what was going on out there. Uh, yeah, and that's again back to that point about it's the access to Richmond itself that's so that's so important. Just by moving through the city, Van Lu's operatives could glean all, all kinds of things. 
Another thing too, is it was awfully brave of her to uh, you know, get up and publicly talk about that espionage so soon after the uh, war was over. Uh, this is in September, what, uh, 1865. People were still being killed in revenge uh, over that. And African-Americans who uh, were, were admitting to this you know, were putting their life in danger. I mean, she couldn't go back down south as a result of this. And as I say, uh, Elizabeth Van Loo kept quiet about her espionage activities because she knew that it could get her and, you know, some of her other fellow unionists lynched uh, uh, after the war. And so I want to make sure that I get to some of the questions that are just pouring in from our audience members. And one of them is directly relevant to this exact conversation. Were any of these spies discovered and what happened to them if they were? Yeah, uh, Timothy Webster was a good example. He, he was one of Pinkerton's spies who uh, was a very successful uh, agent, uh, came down into Richmond, uh, uh, visited Richmond oh, almost a half dozen times, as I recall. Uh, he came down one too many times and the uh, Confederate security agents caught him uh, in, in in Richmond. He was actually had become death, uh, seriously ill there. Uh, and they hung him. Uh, in fact, they hung him twice. Uh, the first time they hung him, the, his neck or his head slipped out of the noose. Hmm. And so they hauled the poor guy back up on the uh, scaffold and hung him again. Uh, very gruesome uh, execution. Uh, all the uh, you know, the jailers and, and the people involved in the hanging then took little uh, clippings of the noose, you know, as souvenirs to take back home. Right. And this happened early in the war and Van Lu was aware of it. I mean, she knew what the, the risks yeah. that she was that she was running. Um, and, you know, spies uh, were routinely imprisoned. Uh, the uh, Union uh, imprisoned some female spies, including Belle Boyd and Rose O'Neill, Greenhow and Antonia Ford. And the Confederates imprisoned many suspected disloyal civilians in a prison called Castle Thunder in uh, in, in Richmond. So um, uh, absolutely, there were uh, there was a, an attempt to sort of crack down on and roust out and, and conspicuously punish people who did who did this kind of work. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Lincoln didn't uh, didn't like hanging spies. Uh, he commuted a lot of the uh, death sentences. Uh, for a lot of the soldiers. He particularly did not want to hang women spies. Uh, and so he did everything he could to avoid doing that. So and like that, Rose Greenhow, he, he shipped her back to Richmond. Right, exactly. Oh boy, he did too, uh, yeah. just to get rid of them. Uh, and so the Southerners uh, seemed to be more, you know, amenable to hanging. In fact, the hanging of Timothy Webster uh, was uh, kind of a breaking point between the two sides over, you know, you know, executions and everything. And I think uh, the, the senior union officers, uh, you know, demanded that, you know, there be some type of retaliation for that. And, and to, you know, just one last observation on that point, a big conceptual takeaway here is that we're, and, and Doug has gestured at a lot of this, we're in a kind of transitional moment here in the mid 19th century with regards to female accountability in wartime. So traditionally women have been thought as non-combatants, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, away from the, the battlefield, uh, victims perhaps, but not but not uh, agents and, and perpetrators who should be rewarded or punished uh, in, in, in wartime. Um, so that some ideas of women as essentially bystanders, as innocents in wartime persisted and they, these spies manipulated them some. Uh, it, uh, Doug has alluded to how the sexism of Confederate authority sort of shielded Van Lu to a certain extent because they couldn't imagine that a middle-aged spinster could be operating a spy ring. And as a consequence, she uh, evaded uh, capture and uh, detection. But, but um, ideas of female accountability that they should and could be punished and rewarded for political acts, that they were independent political agents, were, were gaining ground, you know, so we see we see uh, evidence um, both of the persistence of an older idea of women as innocence and of a newer idea of women as politically accountable. And somewhat ironically, Van Lu's season of accountability comes after the war. As Doug said, she was very careful about not divulging, bragging on the details of what she'd done. But U.S. Grant in 1869, one of his first acts in office is to make her postmaster of Richmond, Virginia, as a reward for the service she had done as the most important spy 
for the union during the war. And, and at that moment, the whole story goes public um, and she becomes vulnerable uh, anew uh, in a sense because um, Grant has publicly rewarded her, but also exposed this wartime role that she had. I could just mention and parenthetically that we think of a postmaster now as essentially a bureaucratic job, but back then a postmastership was a political plum, came with a big salary and an expectation that you would kind of lead a partisan army of other political appointees and so on. And so this was a very unusual thing uh, for a woman and Van Lu used that postmastership as a sort of bully pulpit to decry uh, sexism and racism, to, to expose uh, anti-black violence in, in, in the, uh, the reconstruction era South to argue for women's suffrage. And all of that got her into further trouble, needless to say. And that leads in perfectly to our last question. What happened to all these spies after the Civil War? Our audience wants to know. <laughs> well, Van Lu uh, ended up really living in poverty. Uh, she experienced what a lot of uh, spies and wars uh, experience is they, they be, become shunned by uh, you know, the population around them. Uh, it happened in World War II. The, uh, you know, the, the Germans who spied for the US, uh, who plotted against Hitler uh, in, in the Valkyrie uh, plot, the ones who survived uh, were shunned by fellow Germans after the war. Uh, and that was the case with uh, Van Lu in, uh, in Richmond. She, uh, she gave away most of her money, uh, the rest of it, you know, she really uh, lived ha hand to mouth. Uh, the Northern uh, officers who she had helped uh, in, in prison uh, chipped in money for her, uh, but she died poor. Uh, she was buried in what, Shakto? Shakto Cemetery, yeah, Shakto yeah. Shakto Cemetery uh, vertically, because <laughs> there wasn't enough uh, room to do it horizontally. There were just too many graves there. Uh, yeah, she she um, again by being so outspoken politically after the war, she she was she was shunned, she was threatened. Um, she began to act sort of skittish in public because she was literally receiving death threats from unreconstructed white uh, you know Southerners. Um, although she continued to be a sort of heroine uh, among African Americans in the city and a, and a sort of patron, um, but. Uh, and it's in this kind of uh, period late in life when she's been in, spent the family fortune trying to aid the union war effort, been, been uh, elbowed out of office by uh, not only by ex-Confederates, but by men in her own political party, the Republican Party, who felt that that postmaster job was a plum that a, a office that a man, not a woman, should hold. Um, it's in this period that a sort of image of her as a kind of crazy old crone, uh, crazy bet was a sort of nickname uh, for her among Richmonders late in her uh, in her life, um, uh, and indeed charges that she was mentally unstable were used to um, to, br to to bring an end to her postmastership and to undermine uh, her her sort of political perch and and get her uh, uh, sort of uh, you know shunted out of that job with a ex Confederate man re replacing her. So. She lives under the cloud of this kind of image of a of a of, a, of an unhinged person uh, uh, late in life, and and that is, uh, for all the reasons Doug has so eloquently explained, that's a real pity because she had been the the keynote of her wartime tradecraft was discipline, an incredible uh, discipline. You know, not she was not a volatile. Um, uh, you know, uh, a person. She wouldn't have been able to, uh, to inspire the trust of all the people who worked for her. She wouldn't have been able to, to avoid detection. She wouldn't have been able to keep secrets to send Grant that rose from her own garden, you know, every morning with the newspaper if she hadn't been incredibly uh, disciplined. You know, wow. the, the flip side of it is that a lot of the spies or so-called spies after the war, war tried to make money. <laughs> yeah, off, not Van Lu, right, right. Not right. Van Lu, but a lot yeah. of them uh, did yeah. Yeah. Uh, by claiming that they did uh, all kinds of spy work for the uh, for the Union Army that they really didn't, but they were trying to get compensation for it. I mean, there was one guy, I've forgotten his name, doesn't come to me right now, who claimed he was uh, Lincoln's personal spy and uh, was roaming through uh, 
uh, Virginia and other parts of the South collecting information uh, for Lincoln. Uh, in reality, he was uh, a guy who was uh, publishing travel logs and uh, you know collecting information for travel logs. He claimed that he'd been jailed for his espionage uh, in several different towns. Uh, uh, this is espionage he said he was doing on behalf of Lincoln. Turns out, though, he was jailed for bigamy. He liked to marry different women uh, in different towns that he went to. Um, so there were there again were, big big contrast to Van Lu that you know yeah, the, the, the discipline she she didn't you know seek to sensationalize her her own uh, you know her own story or to or to profit from it so it really is a kind of uh, object lesson in a in a uh, you know self sacrifice and she wanted to be remembered not as a spy but as a but as a patriot. And I think that's the perfect note. I have to say, I could continue this conversation <laughs> easily for another hour, but I'm afraid I'm, we're out of time. Before I pass it back to my colleague, Anna, I want to briefly remind everyone that our two guest speakers have written phenomenal books about espionage during the Civil War. I'd encourage you to read Doug Waller's book, Lincoln Spies, or Liz Varon's book, Southern Lady Yankee Spy. And I'm going to pass it back to Anna. That is unfortunately all the time that we have. I know this conversation could go so much longer um, and that was kind of a distressing end to hear about the, the end of Van Lu's life. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Barron, Douglas Waller and Dr. Robinson for this fascinating conversation tonight. Please sign up for the museum's mailing list and follow us on nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming women's history salons like this one. The New York Historical Society is currently open Tuesdays through Sundays. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website website. And we hope to see you on Central Park West as soon to see Kara Walker, Harper's Pictorial History of the Civil War Annotated on view in our Joyce V. Cowan Women's History Gallery through June 18th. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful evening.